Howdy everybody, my name is Brandon Tong. I am a senior industrial engineering student at Texas A&M and I'm participating in the online REU. Today I'll be giving my final project update on using neural networks to create probability maps for additive manufacturing printability. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about what additive manufacturing is. The idea is to create objects by using layers of melted metal powder stacked on top of each other. Some benefits to this is in most cases, you'll have less processing steps because you can print the entire piece rather than having to create the separate parts and then weld them together. And you can also create more complex shapes uh, that have varying weight and microstructure than what you would typically see. There are also a lot of parameters you do have to consider with additive manufacturing, things like powder size, laser speed, and atomization atmosphere. And oftentimes these parameters can affect one another and change the overall part quality. So to help visualize additive manufacturing a little bit better, I created this picture here. So this powder platform holds up unmelted metal powder, which is in the light blue, as well as the already melted product, which is in the dark blue. So there's a laser overhead that can pass, and after it melts the powder on one layer, the powder platform will lower itself by a small increment, and the powder slider will push, adding a new layer of powder on top. And after this, the laser will pass through again, continue to add layers until the product's done. And this is a little bit, uh, this little GIF here shows SLM, and you can see it's burning the layer and adding a new one on top and repeating. And this is what a normal product would look like. You can see there's a lot of little grid lines here from each layer. One popular method to visualize printability is by using a printability map. These have scan speed on the x-axis of the plot and laser power on the y. To understand how these are created, they use something called the eager sigh model. Used primarily to plot the printability map. And it's important to know that it was adapted from welding. Uh, they use melt pool calculations. You can see that there are three primary failure regions here. We have keyholing, balling, and lack of fusion. With keyholing, this occurs when there's too high power and too low speed. This means that the laser will melt through multiple layers and continue melting the same layers over and over again. With balling, we have too high power and high speed. This can create a variety of over and under melted components that result in varying heights of the piece. And lack of fusion, this occurs when the power is too low. Feed does not have too much of an effect on this part. But what you'll have is small clumps of powder that has not been completely melted that are just layered on top of each other. And this little dotted region here is what we call the successful region because this is where optimal speed and laser power are achieved. And if you wanted to print something, this is where you would want to print because this is where you would have the highest chance of success. So these maps are great. They provide a quick and easy way for us to understand the printable region. And they're also used to visualize how the varying parameters can change the print quality of the part. But they do have a few setbacks. In most cases, they only contain information from one source. This can cause complications with it being a reputable or unreputable source. Reproducibility of these maps can be very difficult due to the large amount of parameters and the effects that they have on each other that may not be listed in the article or the literature that it was from. And a lot of time and money can go into creating a single map. So what can we do about these problems? So the idea of my project is to be able to create a probability map that's based on a probability of successful print versus an unsuccessful print from compiled literature that reports a successful un or unsuccessful print. To do this, we used a deep neural network for our predictions, and we believe that this increases the accuracy because we're pulling from multiple sources of literature instead of just one. We also want this to be usable for any composition and any range of parameters. To help visualize this a little bit better, I created this visual here. This kind of shows the different papers or different articles being fed through the deep neural network, uh, looking at the different parameters that the, each literature article used, as well as how the print ended up turning out, successful versus unsuccessful. And from here, we're able to create a map that has the same format as a printability map using scan speed on the X, laser power on the Y. But instead of creating those four regions, we show probabilities in each of the areas that can outline a, a successful print versus unsuccessful print. This is one of the first probability maps they ended up making. It includes a hatch spacing of 0 to 150 and red indicating successful print and blue indicating unsuccessful. It's also worth mentioning a hatch spacing of 60 to 110 is the most accurate because we have the most data on it. This is mainly because this is the primary range that uh, people in literature test on. So anything outside of that range should be taken with a grain of salt due to the lack of data. And you can kind of see that this map does not necessarily represent the failure regions correctly. We see keyholing and balling both have very distinct red and green regions. Well, like a fusion does have a good blue region, but you can see that the patches that we have here in red and green are very discontinuous. 
This kind of leads us to believe that we have an overfit model to the data that we do have. And because of this, we need to reevaluate how the data is distributed in our data set. Next, I'll be talking about some of the methods used to make these maps better. The first of which is physics-based features. So this uses the rule of mixtures uh, that essentially uses the percentage of an element that exists in an alloy, multiplying it by its elemental property to get a proportional material properties for the alloy based on the elements that exist in it. We then replace the composition features that exist in the database using the rule of mixtures calculations. This helps remove the compositional bias that exists in the model. Next, the model will be able to understand the physics-based patterns that connect to the printability rather than looking at the composition and relating that to its printability. So this will help it understand the underlying physics of what material properties make a good print and what material properties don't. Next is sampling. So this is a method to correct for misrepresentation of data. Uh, one primary method to do this is using artificial data creation, which I'll talk about in this next example. So on the left, you can see we have a data set here, which is 36% orange and 64% green. It's trying to replicate what you see in the center, which is 52% orange and 48% green. But you can see there's a huge discrepancy in the percentages that we have. So what we do with artificial data creation is take a mean and standard deviation of what exists in the orange data and create random values to make that 16%. And this helps reduce our sample bias. While we don't end up using an exact model of this sampling technique, we do end up using a variation of it in our update learning. So with update learning, it's essentially iterative training of our model. And I'll explain that with another example. So you can see we have two images here. This one on the red represents update learning and the one on the right represents traditional learning. The idea is that we show the neural network smaller data sets, which represents like the lower pixel resolution, but it's exposed to more variations of the letter because we're using that artificial, that concept of artificial data creation to create some values that exist within the, uh, the data. So we show it more variations of the letter so it can pick up more distinct features of what is important and what's not important in distinguishing the letter. It's essentially a more generalized model than what we would show it with this uh, 50 by 50 resolution. It contains more artificial data that may not even be as accurate because, because it's artificial, it's essentially random. So the idea is to minimize the flaws of artificial data while still using it to populate the minority classes that exist in our data. This is currently the most up-to-date map that I have. It still uses the 0 to 150 hash spacing and the red to indicate success and blue to indicate unsuccessful. It is also important to note that the 60 to 110 range is still the most reliable because there hasn't been too much data updated since we created the first map. The most important thing to take away from this plot though is all three methods listed in the last slide, the physics-based features, sampling, and update learning have all been applied to create this single map here. You can understand that it looks like the model has started to understand some of the failure regions and some of the physics behind what makes it work. You can also see that the lines are mostly continuous. This is good because this means that our model is more generalized and not overfit on the data that we have. You can see the three failure regions here, keyholing, balling, and lack of fusion. Keyholing and balling are, for the most part, empty with a little bit of an exception here. And lack of fusion is really good because we see a diagonal trend that follows a hypotenuse of the lack of fusion area. And this is really good because this shows us that the model is kind of understanding what is printable and what's not printable based on the understanding of these regions. So to wrap up this project, I created a graphical user interface that also allows for design of experiments. So this is what it looks like. It allows the user to select a composition and then input some values that'll be used to create the plot. Here I'm just using some recommended values to replicate a plot that I created earlier. So once you press upload all, it feeds those values into the neural network and creates the plot. So this is the plot that you saw earlier using the same values. And after that, you can look at the design of experiments, input values that you want those experiments to be based around, and how many samples that you want to, to create. After it's done, it'll create a CSV file with all these values here. And these are all 10 of the values that you want to create. And that's the end of my project. Uh, before going, I do want to say thank you to everyone who administered the RU, as well as a big thank you to my mentor, William Trahern. Thank you.